times you feel unworthy or you, you struggle with believing that your destiny is still on, when that is the very moment you remind yourself and the devil, I've been declared righteous. This is what's happening at The Rock. Grace and peace, Freedom Family. I am Rashonda Edwards, the IROC Nursery Connection Leader. We would like to say... Welcome back! On August the 15th, the nursery will reopen at 9 o'clock and CDC guidelines will be enforced. In order for us to grow, we need... You! If you would like to join the IROC Nursery Connection, contact Roshonda Edwards at the church office at the number on your screen. Freedom Rock is currently looking for a bass guitarist, organist, keyboardist, and guitarist to add to our musical staff for Sunday worship services and additional church services. For all who are interested, please send a letter of recommendation to the cathedral's email, which is freedomrock at frcfc.org. Or you can email the Minister of Music, Roderick Fox, at rfoxmom at frcfc.org. If you have a birthday, an anniversary, or you just want to give someone a shout out, email us at freedomrock at frcfc.org. These have been your announcements. We ask you to keep all announcements in mind and be reminded that Freedom Rock Cathedral is locally committed and globally commissioned. Grace and peace, Freedom family and friends. We welcome you out tonight to our Freedom Rock Cathedral word for the midweek. We thank God for your presence here on today. Listen, God lets us know in Jeremiah 33 and 3 that if we call out unto him that he wants to reveal to us great and mighty things. He said things that are even hidden and fenced in, things we couldn't even imagine. He wants to show and reveal to us if we just cry out and call unto him. Listen, we're preparing to hear word now from our own Bishop Hedgeman. Yes, Bishop Hedgeman. We thank God for his elevation in the spirit and what all God is doing in him, through him, and for us, through him. We're going to hear a word tonight from him following a song from our worship and arts ministry, and then I'll be right back with you. God, receive our worship.
I bless you, saints of God. So glad to have you here for midweek worship. Listen, God has so much he's about to say to us that's going to bless your life. And we're going right into the word of God. Acts 4 and 12 is the scripture that we're beginning to read from. And then we're going to read Matthew 16, 18 through 19. Acts 4 and 12, the word of the Lord says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We can only be saved by the name of Jesus, which is why the series is entitled The Jesus Factor. This series component, however, is the church edition. So how does the Jesus Factor correlate to the church? Matthew 16, 18 says, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay, so we're talking about recalibrating why the other two. Recalibrating why the other two. And we're going to help you understand why that is coined or titled that way. So we understand here in Matthew 16, Jesus says to Peter, I'm going to build my church on the revelation of who I am. Okay. But I don't want the church to just have just revelation of who I am. Watch this. My desire for the church, everyone that's saved and born again, who becomes disciples of me, my desire is that they move in kingdom. Now, kingdom and church is not the same, but as he was said, upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And behold, I give you keys to the church. But he says keys to the kingdom. Now, so he gives us kingdom because God desires that we be calibrated as the church with him in kingdom. So calibrating, we understand, means to be set in harmony with, set in sync with, to be programmed like a remote to a television. God wants us to be, as the church, programmed, synchronized in harmony with his kingdom. So when it comes to kingdom, he says, look, you need some keys now because it, the kingdom is all about getting heaven on earth. Yeah, I want my mind, my agenda in heaven to be in the earth. If heaven says I want people healed, I want healing in the earth. So it takes kingdom to bring the will of God that's in heaven in the earth, which is why he taught his disciples to pray. Pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So we're being calibrated with kingdom. God is recalibrating the church because God is setting us in harmony with his agenda. We've been teaching this. And one of the things that is very important to kingdom is the will of God, respecting the king and his will. To say you're kingdom minded says that you understand that he is king, all right? And his will is very important to God's big picture and every promise he's made to you. The promises of God are housed in his will. And so we've been teaching now that there are three wills. There's the will of God, there's the will of Satan, and then there is your human will. I'm gonna give them to you again. There's God's will, there's the devil's will, and then there's human will, which is also known as the will of man. Now, we've already explained why no longer the will of man and the will of God are the same. All right. Before the serpent convinced them to eat of the tree, the will of God and the will of man were the same. OK. After that, 
now the will of man is different from the will of God. There was separation. Sin brought about separation from man and God. Then there's now the will of the devil who was the one who introduced this whole idea. So of the three wills, we always want to choose the right one, which is God's will. But tonight we're teaching on recalibrating, okay? Divine consent. Why the other two? So if you're taking notes, just write that down. Why the other two? So why do we have the other two? Why do we have the will of man and the will of the devil? It is because the devil's mission is to get as many as he can to join him. He wants as many as he can to end up taking their last breath and spending the rest of their life awaiting judgment. Once judgment comes, they are with him in the lake of fire and hell. That's his desire. He wants as many as he, he's on a mission. He knows his end is already determined and he wants to control others end. So he does that by number one, pushing your own will, your own agenda. All right. And he, and he also does it by pushing his will and his agenda. And so the purpose of the other two, if we're not understanding the purpose of the other two, we will not fully have the true reverence for the one. So it's the fact that I know the devil has a will. It's the fact that I know I have the capabilities of having a will that's contrary to God that makes me really reverence God's. Yeah. Okay. And so our desire is that how do we make sure we choose God's will? How do we make sure we, 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 we make that right choice? Yeah, we we got to make sure our decisions are from God. When we make a decision, we got to make sure that decision is from God. And we said any stance you take, God keeps speaking about those stance. Whenever you say you're going to do something, whenever you say I'm not going to do something, I'm not going to do that or we not going to do that. Or whenever you, you settle in your heart to do something, you need to make sure that you have God's consent. What is God's consent? It is having God's approval or God and or God's agreement and or God's permission. Approval, agreement, permission. Sometimes God says yes, good, boom, he stamps it, he approved it. There are times when God says, okay, I'm with you, all right? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be with you in that. You have his agreement. And there are some times when God says, hey, sure, yes, go. You have his permission, okay? Whenever we don't have his permission, whenever we don't have his agreement, whenever we don't have his approval, we don't have his consent. And you'll never move in the will of God without his consent. So this God consent thing is very important in kingdom because we want to again make sure we are moving in his will. That's where the promise is like. We want to make sure we don't mess up God's big picture. So we do that by making sure we choose, we, we get his consent so that we can stay in his will and avoid the other two. Okay? So the other two is all about warfare. That's what the enemy wants. He wants an error in that decision. So Proverbs 16 and 33 says, um, NIV, the lot cast into the lap. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Every decision is from the Lord. The Message Bible says, make your motions and cast your votes. Message Bible, Proverbs 16 and 33, but God has the final say. So every decision comes from the Lord when we allow God to have final say. Do you get that? So until I've heard from God, I'm not ready to to take a stance, okay, all right? And when I've heard from God, I already know the stance I need to make. Now, when I make that stance, whenever I heard from God, that has to be final say. Nothing else is up for negotiation. I'm in his will, all right? I'm in his will. So, listen here. So we know the will of God, will of man, will of the enemy. The greatest influence, all right, on the era of choosing my will or the devil's will over God's will. And that happens all the time. It does. We can all, we've all done it. We've, we've chosen something we wanted to do and we said, man, that wasn't God. And we later begin to realize, oh, this is not God. Man, it, 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 either, it, either it wasn't God or it was out of timing, all right? And so the error that oftentimes people make to choose their will or the devil's will, which he tempts and he makes it all glamorous and appealing over God's will is influenced by people and things. 
Yeah, the greatest influence that causes us to error in choosing the devil's will or our will over God's will is people and things. We have to be conscious of this. So we mentioned this Sunday, which is so powerful. It is called in the psychological world, imaginative persuasion. You want to write that down. Imaginative persuasion. What is imaginative persuasion again? Imaginative persuasion is where the mind imagines people, their responses as the final factor in their decisions. So I got to make a decision. So really, I'm thinking about people, other people. I'm thinking about their responses as I come to this decision. And I'm imagining what they feel about it, what they're going to say about it, what they're going to do about it. And that persuasion actually influences my final decision. So we've gotten away now from Proverbs 16 and 33 where God has the final season. So yeah, we cast votes. And yeah, people have their own ballots, he says, and make their own motions. Okay, that's imaginative persuasion. But that can't be the final influence in your decision. Or else you're going to always choose the other two. You're going to either choose your own will or the devil's will because you're thinking about people and not God. We must know how to properly move through imaginative persuasion to the degree where God has final say. And we said this Sunday, I'm going to say it again. We need to hear this because it is divinely sent from the Holy Ghost. God wants executive power in your life. When you're talking about final say, that means God has executive power. You know what executive power means? Oh, what he says is ordered. What he says is mandated. Oh, when God said it, oh, it don't matter what anybody else has to say. God has to have executive power in your life. God has to have an executive power in your family. Yeah, brother, I know that's the way everybody feels, and that's, that's the way it makes sense to everybody, but what does God say? Okay? You better know that. You better know that. You better know that. Again, executive power. Imagine the persuasion. So let's look at this in Scripture. Let's look at 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. Let's look at verse uh, 18 through 24. Now, as we turn to 1 Samuel 15, we're going to look at verse 18 through 24. I want to give you factors, some factors in, watch this, imaginative persuasion. What are some factors that causes us to imagine what other people are going to say and think that persuades us to not choose God's will? Okay, before we read this, I'm going to give you to these because some of these scriptures are going to allow us to see some of these things. One of them is man's response. One of the things that help, that influences imaginative persuasion is when people live their life based off man's response. You choose this because you know, oh God, they're going to talk about it. They're going to like it. You say that because you know it's going to cause and command attention. Yeah, you wore that and picked that because you knew, oh, I'm thinking about how much better it's going to be than somebody else's. Oh, if I do that, I'm going to make everybody proud. Ain't nobody going to be mad. You know, man's response. Write that down. Number one, man's response. Okay? So the reason for the other two, uh, the enemy uses, the, he has the will of man and he has the will of the devil because he understands that these things keep us from God's will. We said the greatest influence in choosing our will and the devil's will over God's will is people and things. Here's the people piece. Man's response. What's the second thing? Okay? Man's retaliation. There are times when people don't choose the will of God out of fear of the retaliation of what people are going to say. The retaliation of who's going to be upset. The retaliation of, oh, all that they're going to say about me. You know, there are times when as a CEO, I have to make decisions. Sometimes those decisions uh, are sometimes HR related decisions. Sometimes those are decisions to, hey, something has to be done, you know, and uh, there are times when that temptation comes. Oh, they're not going to like this. Oh, if we make this change. Oh, if we make this policy, people are going to maybe move their child out. Or maybe this is going to cause us to maybe lose some money from not picking up or being able to pick up at this particular school or this location. You know, or if we raise the price of this tuition. A man's retaliation. But... Uh, we know that, you know, it's not God's will that we take away from people. We, 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 we do a disservice to people out of 
fear of other people. That can't be God's will. Sometimes the will of God brings about retaliation, persecution. And people sometimes do not choose the will of God, not only because of man's response, they, they, they're so uh, addicted to the fanfare and the praise of people, but also contrary-wise, man's retaliation. People afraid of being disliked. People afraid of people talking about them. Oh, they're going to do a video on me. You, can't, you cannot walk in the will of God and you definitely can't move in kingdom fearful of man's retaliation. What's another one? Material reward and material resources. There are times when people choose the will of man or, or the will of the devil because they are persuaded imagining the material reward or the material resources that will come on the other side of that decision. You remember Jesus told the rich ruler, he said, hey, I've done all these things since I was a child. I love my father. I hadn't killed anything. Jesus said, sell what you have and give to the poor. What did he do? He thought about his material. The Bible said that man went on by his way. He said, no, I ain't going to choose the will of God here. I'm going to choose with my own because his mind was so persuaded by his material resources Okay, and his material reward. Achan hid the blessing, he hid the, the item under the tent, cursed them. They lost a small battle at Ai. After big old Jericho, they lost little old Ai because he had material reward on his mind. That's what he was thinking about. We got a, what's another one? Uh, monetary, um, momentary remorse. Momentary remorse. What do you mean? Sometimes people choose the will of man or say choose the will of the devil because they don't want to deal with their remorse. They don't, they don't want to deal with feeling bad. I don't want nobody. I, 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 oh, man, I know if I do this, I'm going to feel bad about the people that wasn't happy with what I did. You know that that person ain't doing nothing because of nothing but pure D havoc. In your company, havoc in your department, havoc in your house, havoc in your money, havoc in your relationships, but you still got them on because you, you don't want to deal with the momentary remorse of having to move on or having to reposition them. And so guess what you do? You choose your will to keep peace, to keep them in your life, and you're still more headed, you're still frustrated, still going nowhere, still wasting time, still wasting resources. Because of that momentary remorse, we must be conscious of these things. And not only that, but lastly, the masses rejection. Sometimes people choose the will of man as well as the will of the devil because of the masses rejection. People are going to reject you. Everybody ain't going to like you. And they definitely not going to like you when you stand for the will of God, when you start to move in the will of God. This is by design. And I heard something years ago that said, listen, it's not rejected if you was never accepted. Think about that. If they really never accepted you, then they really not rejecting you because you would never accept it. And you got to get comfortable knowing. You got to start to expect, not to the degree to where you become unhealthy, it becomes an issue, and you become dysfunctional, and you become rebellious. You know, some people rebel because they don't like me anyway. You reject me. I'm going to do it anyway. You know, that's unhealthy. But you do have to be real. You have to be a realist that there are times when moving in the will of God, the masses are going to reject you. OK. And it's amazing that they do that. And then over time, they turn around and then they praise you. The same people that rejected you turn around and praise you. So you might as well choose the will of God anyway. Again, I'm going to give you those factors for imaginative persuasion where people influence our final decision and not God. We give people and things executive power, not God. Number one, there's man's response. Number two, there's man's retaliation. Number three, there's material reward and material resources. Number four, there's momentary remorse. And then number five, there is the masses rejection. Let's see this in scripture and we're going to kind of wind up today and I'm going to encourage you with one, one scripture to close us out after I show you these. 1 Samuel 15, 18 through 24. I think we may have touched on this Sunday. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, verse 18, and the Lord sent thee on a journey. The prophet comes to Saul and said, now the Lord sent you on a journey. Okay? And he said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. God said, I want you to go. I want you to fight. 
And I don't want you to stop fighting until everything is consumed. Pretty clear, right? Okay. The Bible says in verse 19, wherefore then does thou not obey the voice of the Lord? He said, now where did you, where, where did you get off? Where did you get this wrong? The prophet is checking the leader, Saul. He says, but didst thou fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord? He said, now the Lord said, fight and don't fight till everything is consumed. But you instead pursued the spoil, the good things, the material things to take back with you. Verse 20 says, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone the way that the Lord sent me. I brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. You did do that, Saul, but that, that ain't all you did. That's all God told you to do, but you did that and more. He didn't know the prophet. God has sent the prophet. The Bible says here in verse number 21, no, verse 20, and Saul said unto Samuel, yes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone away against it. I brought back the king of Malachi. I have utterly destroyed the, uh, the, I mean, I brought back the king of um, Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Verse 21 says, watch this. He said, but the people took the spoil. They took those good sheep. They took those good oxen. And the chief of the things, the chief of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord their God and give gas. Well, now he tries to make an excuse for it. Well, the reason why they kept because they were going to use it for a sacrifice. Hmm. Verse 22. And Samuel said, Wow. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as obeying the voice of the Lord? Well, God take more pleasure in you giving him a sacrifice or you obeying him. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, thou has, he has now rejected thee as from being king. Look at verse 24. Here's the scripture I wanted to get to. And Saul said unto Samuel, I've sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. I did not let God have final say. I transgressed it. I knew what God's will was, but I transgressed against God's will. And I went my own way. Watch the imaginative persuasion. He said, I transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I Fear the people and obey their voice. He said, that's what God told me to do, but I had the people on my mind. What they were going to say, how they were going to respond, how they were going to retaliate. And he said, I obeyed their voice, so I followed the will of myself. And in this instance, the will of myself was more concerned about the people. Or if you want to look at it as if the devil was using the people, I followed the will of the devil. One thing we do know, he did not follow the will of God. And if we don't deal with this imaginative persuasion of thinking about other people and allowing that to influence our decisions, we'll continue to miss the will of God. We'll continue to not consult God and get his consent, okay? And we will not be the people we should be walking in calibration in sync with the kingdom of God. The will of God can't be done in the earth if we're going to continue to follow our own will or follow the will of the enemy. Worried about people or trying to go after and get things. If we just pursue the will of God, God's going to take care of the rest. I'm going to leave you with this motivational here. Listen. Hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this. Because we got to increase our fear of the Lord. How do I fix this? I got to fear the Lord. It's your fear of the Lord that causes us to choose God's will over our own and over the will of the enemy. Matthew 10 and 28 said, don't fear him who can destroy your body. Fear him who can destroy the body and the soul. We got to fear the Lord. Okay? We got to fear the Lord. I fear the Lord. He said, fear him who can destroy the body and the soul. Man can just destroy the body. In other words, I fear the Lord should be unparalleled to any other. Nothing should be greater in your life. You shouldn't fear nothing more than you fear the Lord or respect the Lord or reverence the Lord.
Yeah. Nothing. It should be unparalleled to any other. So there's people in your life, places in your life, companies in your life, situations in your life, circumstances in your life that you fear more than Lord than God. You better deal with that because it's going to affect your ability to walk in the will of God. It's going to affect your ability to consult God, get his consent, and follow his consent. You know, it's people that fear cancer more than God. Yeah, it's people that fear death more than God. It's people that fear the government more than God. It's people that fear people that live in their neighborhood more than He said, don't fear him who can destroy your body. Fear him who can destroy the body and soul. I fear God. As you begin to, re re to pray and ask God to increase your fear of the Lord, you will not be intimidated nor influenced by man's response, man's retaliation, material reward, momentary remorse, or the masses rejection. Hear this. Whenever the fear of man is greater than the fear of God, we forfeit favor. So see, God wants you to understand the importance of not allowing the fear of man and people and those things to persuade your decision. God has to have final say if you're going to choose his will and be calibrated in his kingdom. To move in kingdom is to give the king final say. Okay, And we refuse to forfeit the favor we receive and live in when we have given God final say meaning we have consulted him and we've consent and we've gotten his consent and submitted to that consent. Last scripture, Psalms 118, verse 6 and 7. And we're done. Thank you, Lord, for a good lesson today. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. Yeah, you will not be bullied. You will not be influenced. You will not be intimidated by this imaginative persuasion. You're giving God glory to his name, executive power. Amen. In your life. We're going to trust God before we fear man. What did I just say? What you say, Bishop? We're going to trust God before we fear man. Say it again, Bishop. We're going to trust God before we fear man. Why don't you set yourself in agreement with what I'm declaring over your life right now? Go ahead and make it personal. Say, I will trust God before I fear man. Oh, glory to God. Before I allow the fear of man to result my final decision in choosing my will or the devil's will, I'll trust God. Hallelujah. Psalms 118 verse 6 says, The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Look what he said, mere mortals. It's people with social security numbers just like you. Yeah, people who got put on clothes just like you. More. He said, what can mere mortals do? I know some people saying, oh, I know what mere mortals can do to you. They can get you fired. I know what mere mortals can do for you. They can, they can blow up your house. I know what mere mortals can do to you. They can make your life a living. You know what? But see, you're not reading it right. He says, the Lord is with me. What can mere mortals do to me? What can mere mortals, other humans, do to you when the Lord is with you? Keep it in context. When the Lord is with you, what can they do to you? So we must trust God instead of fearing a man. We must, glory to God, get his, consult him, get his consent and trust him. Because when God is with you, he leaves. What, what can mere mortals do to you? He said, the Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph. On my enemies. The Lord, he said, the Lord is my helper. He's talking about the favor of God. God, God is favoring you. God is helping you. God is assisting you. God is making ways for you. Let's look at it in the message Bible again. The Bible says here, glory to God. Push to the wall, I call to God. From the wide open spaces, he answered. God's now at my side. I'm not afraid. Who would dare lay a hand on me? God's my strong champion. I flick off enemies like flies. Wow. See, you can't talk like that when you done chose your will. You can't talk like that. That can't be your testimony when you done chose the devil's will. So in the kingdom of God, yes, we have opposition. In the kingdom of God, yes, things come against us. But we know that if we trust God, if we choose God, if we can get his consent and we obey him, we calibrated with him. We walking with him. We in sync with him. And the Lord says, you'll flick your enemies off like flies.
because he's with you. I'm praying today, now, that never again will you forfeit favor. Never again will you put up for grabs only what God can do for you for choosing, following, submitting, and obeying his will. I'm getting ready to pray for people who are saying, that's my weakness. I worry about people too much. That's my weakness, Bishop. Oftentimes, the things that I do do, I do it so I can hear people praise it. So I can hear people brag on it. Or things that I should do, I don't do because I know people aren't going to like it. And this is hindering my ability to be the kingdom citizen that God has called me to be. Thank you for this word. And I want to grow in this. I don't want to stay subject to this. I want to grow from here. I hear you. And I'm getting ready to pray for you. Just receive this prayer. Father, I thank you now in Jesus' name for being such a powerful, promising God. God, I thank you that you fill us with you. And I pray, God, that you begin to fill the heart, fill the life of those who are watching now. Where we're so full of you, God, we have security, yes, strength. We have some base, glory to God, on the inside of us that allows us to be able to stand when opposition is yet before us. I pray, God, that the other two wills, our human will, and even the will of the devil will no longer be so in the lives of these who are watching, but only the will of God will be our portion. God, I pray in Jesus' name that as those thoughts of other people and even things, incentives, whatever those things may be that have influenced us to choose those other two wills and not yours, today they relinquish their power. In the name of Jesus, we disarm them from being able to control and influence us in error. Tonight, we vow that we will choose the Lord and his will and his way. We call ourselves kingdom citizens. We declare every decision we make going forward is from the Lord. And we thank you for helping us, for being with us. And we will not fear what man can do to us. Now, Holy Spirit, help us to live this way, to think this way, to move this way, in sync, calibrated with our Father. We receive help from the Holy Spirit tonight. Glory to God. He's right here alongside of us. And I believe after tonight, he's helping us step by step, moment by moment, day by day, how to consult, how to receive God's consent, and how to stay in sync with him. Our life will never be the same. I call you what the Bible calls you, child of God. I call you strong. Hallelujah. Strong. Mm-hmm. And in this place, you will flick your enemies off like flies. Be encouraged. Be inspired. Until next time, you be blessed. My God, what a powerful word from heaven. We thank God for Bishop Hedgeman for blessing us tonight from a word from the Spirit. Listen, we would dare not leave without giving you an opportunity to accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It is easy as ABC. Admit, believe, and confess. We just want to say first, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of salvation. And then we need to believe in our heart that God raised Christ Jesus from the dead for our sins. And then confess, Jesus, you're not only my Savior, but you're my Lord. If you do those things according to Romans 10 and 9, you're now saved. We celebrate with you just as heaven is doing as well. Write us, like, share, comment. Let us know how the word of God is impacting your lives. Let us know how it's changing you from inside and out. We thank you so much for your time here on tonight. God bless you. Have a good evening.